for your unmerited love that we have begun looking at in the book of Romans. What a magnificent text of Scripture week in and week out as the Apostle Paul unpacks for us justification by faith in Christ alone. Lord, as we saw last week how that salvation is through faith and not of works, we come with eager anticipation of Paul getting even more specific to the issue of circumcision and how that even becomes an object lesson, an illustration for us of a lot of the works righteousness and the performance that people try to do to get right with you. God, we pray as well, not just for unbelievers in our midst, but for believers because we get back on that old track that we demolished. We, again, try to perform. Remind us afresh every moment of every day that we are never more loved by God than when we are right now. And that it's not a matter of our doings. Our doings post-salvation is just coming out of hearts overflowing with gratitude for what Christ has already accomplished. And Father, since you find your satisfaction in your son's performance and not ours, help us to find our value and our satisfaction there as well. Use your spirit to teach us your word for the glory of Christ we ask. Amen. Well, beloved, I'd like to preach to you a sermon that I've entitled The Blessedness of Salvation Apart from Performance. I trust that you have found your place in Romans chapter 4. We're going to be looking at just a few verses today. Before we get to our text, to orient our, our thinking in the right direction, have you heard the statistic that there's 1.6 billion Roman Catholics in the world? 1.6, not million, but billion. That's a lot of millions to get to billions, is it not? That means one in every six people on the globe are Catholic. And again, we don't pick on Roman Catholicism, but it's one of the false teachings that encompasses any other teaching but biblical Christianity that relies on what man does. If you believe Roman Catholic doctrine, there is an emphasis on human works. Every religion is either human works or biblical Christianity relying on divine accomplishment. Stick that under your bonnet. You know, there was uh, years ago a copy of a major English language Indian news magazine because we couldn't read it otherwise. The feature story was on a great Hindu religious festival called Mahakab Mala, which is celebrated every 12 years at the confluence of Ganga, which is the Ganges and Yamuna rivers. It's claimed to be the world's largest single religious event. Not in Rome, but in India. Disregarding the difficult journey, the great expense, and the chilling waters, multitudes of the faithful are drawn to the celebration. Caste and economic class are temporarily set aside. The festival is led by a group of stark naked holy men who lead a procession of millions of pilgrims down to the water. Fakirs sit on beds of nails and walk over broken glass and lie down on hot coals. A common sight is to see worshipers taking long knives and piercing their tongues in order to sentence themselves to eternal silence as a way to appease their myriad gods, little g. Some worshipers will stare at the sun until they're blinded. Others intentionally cause their limbs to atrophy in gestures of worship. One man had held his arm upright for eight years. Although his arm muscles had long since atrophied, his uncut fingernails had continued to grow and descended some two and a half feet below his hands over those eight years. One Hindu 
holy book declared this, quote, those who bathe at the conflux of the black and white river, the Ganga and the Yamuna, go to heaven, unquote. Another sacred writing says that the pilgrim who bathes at this place wins absolution for his whole family, and even if he's perpetrated a hundred crimes, he is redeemed the moment he touches the Ganga whose waters wash away his sins. At this festival, the waterfront is lined with countless shaving booths in which the devoted strip themselves bare and have every hair on their body shaved off, including their eyebrows and eyelashes. Every shaved hair is collected and all the hair is then thrown into the filthy water. Hindu writings assure pilgrims that for every hair thus thrown in, you are promised a million years residence in heaven. The article closed with the comment that millions who come with spiritual hunger depart with peace in their hearts and renewed faith. Friends, what hellish, damning deception that Satan has concocted in this religion and many others. It's created under Satan's inspiration convincing people that they can be made right with God and guaranteed a place in heaven by performing certain rites and ceremonies. You know, some religions are a lot more sophisticated and humanly attractive than others are, but all share the common false belief in works righteousness in some form or the other. The natural man instinctively believes that somehow he can make himself right with God by his own efforts. And so we've been studying with, at the feet of the Apostle Paul, unmerited love bestowed on the unworthy, and that that salvation gift is received by faith. Our previous text, verses 1 to 4 of Romans 4, or excuse me, 1 to 8 of chapter 4, teaches, like so many other passages, the insufficiency of human works to merit salvation. There must be a righteousness outside of ourselves, since none are righteous. So too in Judaism, not just in Roman Catholicism or Hinduism or any of the other false religions. We come to a more specific issue, not just the failure of works righteousness, but the most held to in Judaism, that of their circumcision. You come to... Verses 9 to 12, and there's a lot of Bible students and scholars who wonder what the practical significance is of a lesson on circumcision. What can Goyim uh, learn? What can us uncircumcised Gentiles, even if we'd been circumcised in the flesh, but not circumcised in heart? What can we learn? We learn that circumcision, in particular, is not the basis for justification. We understand that circumcision today is a matter of personal preference, and it's more attached to hygiene, but to slip on our first century sandals to hear through Jewish ears that Paul was preaching to in Romans 4, it was not a hygiene issue, it was a religious issue. High significance, religious overtones. We must understand the Bible in its own culture and times. We don't try to make it contemporary. How significant, how applicable is a sermon on circumcision? We go back to the time of the Bible and the understanding of the Bible so that we might be edified and learn the lessons. It's an apt example and object lesson standing for all religious practice or performance. I want you to notice another installment of unmerited love of God which nullifies personal performance. Would you set your eyes on verse 1? I know we were through the first eight verses, but uh, uh, Paul is just kind of bleeding over in the next section. Romans chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? 
For if Abraham was justified by works, he's got something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a, as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Notice this question as you get into verse 9. Is this blessing, speaking of verses 7 and 8, is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised that righteousness might be credited to them. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. Notice the affirmation. Verses 9 through the first half of verse 11. This is Paul's affirmation. It's a, we start off with a question of blessing in verse number 9. You know, we didn't spend a whole lot of time last week in the last couple of verses. Uh, Abraham took up most of the text. And then you get to David, who was the greatest king of Israel, who was high in their history books. Verses 1 to 8 brought up Abraham primarily as the greatest Jewish example. But then he introduced David greatest king. And here he merges both as he goes to circumcision but continues the same subject. The subject introduced by David, you might recall that verses 7 and 8 and the NASB, you see it in the italics, uh, cluing us in that he's citing from Psalm 32, the first two verses, Psalm 32, 1 and 2, that the biggest blessing in life is knowing your lawless deeds have been forgiven, your sins have been covered, whose sin the Lord does not credit to your account. Everything that comes from the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. David clearly understood God's grace. In his great penitential psalm, written after Nathan confronted him, with his adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband Uriah, David cast himself entirely on God's grace. He know what he deserved. He says, be gracious to me, O God. According to thy loving kindness, according to the greatness of thy compassion, blot out my transgressions. Did he deserve it? Not at all. Did he plead it? Absolutely. He confessed to God against thee, the only I have sinned and done what is evil in thy sight, so that thou art justified when thou dost speak and blameless when you judge. David knew only God could purify and wash away his sins and blot out all his iniquities. Only God could create in him a pure heart and deliver him from guilt and from the sin that produced that guilt in the first place. That's why he declares in Psalm 32, the person of genuine faith is blessed because by God's gracious provision, his lawless deeds have been covered because his many particular sins have been covered and because the basic sin and depravity of his fallen nature, the Lord will not take into account. So David was justified as his forefather Abraham by faith. And every believer after that is justified in the same way, only by faith. 
A sinner's faith is graciously accepted by God and counted for him as righteousness for Christ's sake. That's an amazing gospel truth. And yet man thinks that he can work himself into God's favor, like the opening illustration I gave. We just don't have the righteousness that Paul earlier in Romans says that we don't have. It's the wrong kind of currency. The story is told of a poor farmer who had been sa- sa- who'd saved his money for years in order to buy an ox to pull his plow. When he thought he'd have enough saved, he traveled a great distance to the nearest town to shop for an ox. And he soon discovered, however, that the paper money he'd been saving had been replaced by a new currency and that the date for exchange for the old to the new had long since expired. <laughs> Imagine working for years. I'll only have your dreams go down the, the tank. Well, because he was illiterate, the man asked a neighbor schoolboy to write a letter to the president of their country explaining his dire situation and asked for an exemption. The president was touched by the letter and wrote back to the farmer, quote, the law must be followed because the deadline for exchanging bills has already passed. The government can no longer change your bills for the new ones. Even the president is not exempt from this rule. However, the president continued, because I believe that you really work hard to save this money, I am changing your money for new money from my own personal funds so that you will be able to buy your ox. You know where this illustration is going, don't you? Before God, every person's good works are as worthless as the farmer's outdated money. Whether you're in the Roman Catholic Church relying on indulgences or the sacraments or you're a Hindu washing in the river, God Himself in the person of His Son has paid the debt we owed. And when a confessed sinner casts himself on God's mercy and accepts in faith the Lord's atoning work on his behalf, he can stand forgiven and divinely righteous before him, not because of righteous doings we have done, but believing in the righteous doing Christ has done, credited to our account. So this is what we were learning last week in the first eight verses of Romans 4. So here's the question that comes up. Is that blessing David just spoke of on those who have been circumcised or those who remain uncircumcised? Good question, Paul. We have to take for granted that the rabbis of Paul's day applied David's words exclusively to the Jews, the circumcision, because they did. But Paul rejects what he anticipates as their question and assumption and gives his rebuttal and goes back to Genesis 15, 6. Now, earlier on in the chapter, back in verse 3, he quotes Genesis 15, 6. Drop your eyes on verse 9, which we're studying this week. For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. So as, as Paul anticipated what the religious Jews were already thinking as he's teaching... He goes back to Genesis 15, 6 again. Because Psalm 32, the blessedness that David proclaims has to square with all previous revelation because Scripture never contradicts itself. What David teaches needs to square with the example of Abraham, the forefather in the faith. Why did God require circumcision for Abraham and all his descendants is the question that they're all asking. Why do we have to do the painful deed in order to obey God? Well, if you were to open to some Jewish writings, which I know you probably got on your bookshelves, right? You could take out the Jewish apocryphal book of Jubilees, which declares this. They said this law 
is for all generations forever, and there is no circumcision of the time and no passing over one day out of the eight days, for it is an eternal ordinance ordained and written on the heavenly tables. And every one that is born, the flesh of whose foreskin is not circumcised on the eighth day, belongs not to the children of the covenant which the Lord made with Abraham, for he belongs to the children of destruction." Nor is there moreover any sign on him that he is the Lord's, but he is destined to be destroyed and slain from the earth. That is not salvation, that is destruction. A lot of Jews believe that salvation was based on their obedience to God and being circumcised, and therefore their eternal security rested in that religious right. In his commentary on the book of Moses, Rabbi Menachem wrote this. He said, our, our rabbis have said that no circumcised man will ever see hell. You get that? Did, you hear, did your Jewish ears hear that? Circumcision was considered such a mark of God's favor that it was taught if a Jew had practiced idolatry, his circumcision must first be removed before he could go down to hell. And since it's humanly impossible to undo circumcision... Presumably, it would be accomplished by a direct act of God. In other words, it can't happen. You've been circumcised, you're in the kingdom forever, no matter what idolatry you practice. Such beliefs were so strange in Judaism that many of them were carried over into Christianity. You know, you got the, the first church council in Acts 15 that we would read about in our public reading of Scriptures through the book of Acts. The Jerusalem Council acknowledged that neither circumcision nor any other ceremony or human act, no matter how divinely ordained, could bring salvation. Circumcision never saved a Jew, and it can never save a Gentile either. No need to turn there. Listen to what Paul wrote to the believers in Galatia, in Galatians 5. Paul said it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he's under obligation to keep the whole law. You've been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace." You know, a person who trusts in circumcision or any other ceremony or any other work nullifies the work of Christ on his behalf. It's all or nothing. He placed himself under the law, and a person under the law must obey it with absolute perfection, which is humanly impossible. Paul says in Galatians 5, 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. That's the issue. Faith working through love. I hope you see how profitable, how applicable an exposition in our day from the Apostle Paul of his day is for us to learn. Because the, the issue for them was circumcision. But it applies to any issue in which man is trying to work his righteousness out. How about something that maybe, uh, since I know many of our folks were saved out of the Roman Catholic system, let's illustrate it that way. If you were to go to your, your old library of your, your heresy and the, the poison that in, infected your life for many years, you could uh, take off from the bookshelf Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma by Dr. Ludwig Orr, who explains the cardinal teachings of Roman Catholicism in regard to salvation and spiritual blessing. Ott defines a sacrament by the Roman Catechism as, quote, a thing perceptible to the senses which on the ground a divine institution possesses the power of effecting and signifying sanctity and 
righteousness, unquote. He goes on to say that the sacraments confer grace immediately without the mediation of a person's faith and that the sacraments confer sanctifying grace on the receivers. Since sacramental rites confer regeneration, forgiveness, the Holy Spirit, and eternal life, for the dispensing of this grace, it's necessary, he says, that the minister accomplish the sacramental sign in the proper manner. And uh, I don't know how we got into the conversation the other day with some of us in the church, and I didn't come out of Roman Catholicism, and I, I make the motions in the wrong directions, and I know that that is anathema if you've uh, gone through the catechism. You know, countless millions firmly trust in some other form of religious ceremony or activity than circumcision that Paul is addressing, though it equally applies. You know, the sacraments of penance, holy orders, marriage, and extreme unction are claimed to impart in and of themselves other spiritual benefits of divine grace. You know, in some Protestant groups, hold similar doctrines believing, for example, baptism places a person into the new covenant apart from any knowledge or faith on his part. Consequently, the baptism of an infant is as valid as the baptism of a mature professing adult, and it just does not equate biblically. Back to the text. Verse 9, for we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. Paul is referring again to Genesis 15, 6. This is the admitted fact that we say. And the emphasis lies on Abraham's faith, not his works. He's justified not by works, but by faith. So the question is, is pivotal. When the Jews before they could even get it out of their lips to Paul, that blessing that David pronounces is on the circumcised or the uncircumcised. Glad you asked it, guys, before you asked it. How or when in verse 10? How is it credited? It's not just a matter of chronology and when, but under what circumstance, what status was Abraham in when God declared him righteous? In his circumcision state or his uncircumcision state? And he says it was while he was uncircumcised. You know, with slight slight variation of wording, this appears in verse 10, verse 11, and verse 12. I I want you to see what's going on here. I want to tutor you in your Bible interpretation for just a second here. History helps inform theology because, as I've said before, history is theological, is it not? It's his story. This historic lesson is one that the Jews failed to learn. That's why I'm teaching it to you today. That's why we're studying it. Some truths in the Bible can only be understood by studying the time element involved. That's what we're going to do. You know, in the ears of even the Gentiles of Paul's day, because he's addressing the saints at Rome, made up mostly of Gentile believers, and though the Jews are coming back into the country, they're in the church as well. So how are they hearing this? You know, is this, this blessing for the circumcised or the uncircumcised? And so the Jew, Gentiles must have been hearing the gospel invitation, just believe on Him, though you're uncircumcised. Faith in Christ. Mark it down, friends. You find the institution of circumcision. Where did God tell His people to get circumcised? Genesis 17, verses 10 to 13. Back in Genesis 17 and verse number 10, here is what Abraham was told by God. He said, this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. And every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A servant who is born in the house or is bought with money from any foreigner who is not of your descendants. 
That is where God initially said to be circumcised. Genesis 17 comes after Genesis 15. Is that the way you learn to do math, right? Uh, Genesis 15, 16, 17, right? So Genesis 17 is where circumcision is commanded by God. Chapter 15, verse 6, which Paul had said earlier in Romans 4 and now in our text in Romans 4, that Abraham was justified by faith. That's Genesis 15, not Genesis 17. You know the old story, what came first, the chicken or the egg? What came first? Regeneration or or declared righteous? And then circumcision. Fourteen years elapsed between Genesis 15 and Genesis 17. So let me make sure we're tracking. Genesis 15 comes before Genesis 17, am I correct? Were you with me? It might sound like an obvious lesson, but again, remember that the Jews missed the lesson. Their tradition had interpreted the preeminence of Abraham and the distinctive privilege of Jewish people as his descendants to such an extent in terms of circumcision and had automatically associated blessedness in this present life And that which is to come from the words of David, from circumcision. But if we learn the historical lesson well, it runs counter to the Jewish distortion. In uh, some have been chattering to me, when are we offering the hermeneutics class again? Hold on, it's coming soon. One of the principles we teach in hermeneutics is progressive revelation. You you start reading your Bible at the beginning of 2024. We are halfway through Genesis and two-thirds of the way through Mark with some Psalms sprinkled through the first two weeks of our Bible reading plan. Well, you got to go a long ways into your Bible to get to Romans chapter 4 that we're at studying today. There's been a lot of details filled in between the first book and what will end it in the book of Revelation. There's the progress of revelation. We, we need to learn how to read our Bibles in the right direction. Matter of fact, there's a good article I assigned in the hermeneutics class on reading your Bible in the right direction. This is another value of why do we read through the Bible in a year? It's to get the main storyline in our minds from Genesis to Revelation so that when we get down into the details here, we can fit it in in the progress of Revelation. The old Westminster systematic professor, John Murray, in teaching his students of his day this progress, he said, we must regard Genesis 12, 1 to 3, Genesis 15, 4 to 6, and Genesis 17, 1 to 21 as the progressive unfolding to Abraham of God's covenantal grace and purpose and the faith of Abraham registered in all these instances is the same faith responded with enlarged understanding and devotion to the progressive disclosures of God's purpose. Abraham hadn't gotten to what Moses tells us in Genesis 17 until Genesis 17. He went through Genesis 15, 16 life experiences firsthand. Abraham's circumcision is not related until two chapters later in chapter 17 of Genesis. We're told in Genesis 17, 1, that at this point of circumcision, how old is he when he got circumcised? Genesis 17, 1, he's 99. Many, many men are grateful that uh, they don't remember their circumcision. This is a good thing. How would you like to be 99 and be circumcised? You backtrack from Genesis 17.1, where he's 99, to Genesis 16.16. When Ishmael is born, he was 86, which is sometime after what's recorded in chapter 15. So again, we're just in the chronology. The, The Jewish rabbis, some of them would say that there's been at least 29 years lapsed 
It can't be any less than 14 years between Abraham's circumcision, but after his salvation transaction where he believed God and it was credited as righteousness. That's when he became a Jew, having a special purpose in the plan of God, and you see the Jewish people take up the whole Old Testament. So, what's the correlation of circumcision with faith? Abraham was justified by God in Genesis 15. He was brought into covenant community with God in in chapter 17, where God said, here's the identity of my people. It will be clear and unambiguous. You're going to be uh, circumcised. It contributed in no way to the exercise of his faith, nor justification by faith, but it had a correlation. We see that uh, if you go back to our text in, in Romans 4. What does Paul say? He, verse 10 established that uh, he was credited as righteous while he was uncircumcised, not while circumcised. Verse 11, and he received this sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while he was uncircumcised. Circumcision was a sign and seal, Paul says. Not a secular rite, nor merely a mark of racial identity. It was related to faith. It signified and sealed his faith. Though the faith existed prior to this exercise, it was connected somehow. Racially, Abraham is the father of the Jewish people, but spiritually, he's the father of all believers, Jew and Gentile. I'm going to tie in some of those thoughts later on in the message. I don't want to import... New Testament theology that's going to be here later on in the book of Romans, but it might help us think through the Jewish lens here. You begin studying the book of Romans. Man is justified by faith. He is born again of the Spirit of God. He is saved, to put it in our vernacular, right? And then he is sanctified. Salvation and sanctification are not the same thing, but they are connected. Those who are saved will be sanctified and grow into the image of Christ. We, but we don't get washed up in order to get saved. We do not merit God's favor. You don't get the cart before the horse. So Paul says here, circumcision was a sign. Simeon is the term. It was a token, a distinguishing mark by which something is known. We just got done with New Year's preceded by Christmas, so we had four weeks of nativity readings, did we not? One of those nativity readings was in uh, Luke 2. Luke 2.12, where they were told that this will be a sign for you that you will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And guess what? That's what they found. It was a miraculous sign. A sign points to the existence of that which it signifies. So in Genesis 17, where circumcision takes place, it's clearly stated to be the outward sign of the covenant. It was a pointer to the reality of which it signified. Because not all Jews were Jews. We talk today about being a completed Jew where a Jew realizes they missed the Messiah and they're a completed Jew. So they're not just a Jew ethnically, but a Jew spiritually. Circumcision was the identifying sign and a seal. Think of the signet ring of a, of a king who, who, that would... Uh, mark that wax of the document that you just received. It authenticates, it confirms, it guarantees the genuineness of that which it signifies. So this term seal is added to sign. It gives that thought of authentication. An outward 
and visible ratification and guarantee of the righteousness by faith, which he already possessed two chapters earlier, Genesis 15. He was already righteous by faith and then came into covenant and was circumcised. This continuing identifying mark was seen later on in the the Old Testament. You remember after God took his unbelieving generation of people that didn't believe him, didn't take his promises serious, and they died on the backside of the desert, and the new generation that goes into the promised land, well, circumcision had fell out of style. And so in Joshua 5, you guys got to get circumcised because this has been the sign of the covenant ever since Genesis 17. You get to the New Testament. Paul really had no problem with a Jew being circumcised as long as they didn't attach that circumcision to faith like the Galatians did and the Judaizers coming along. How about Timothy? Timothy? who joined Paul in ministry. Paul circumcised Timothy, who was only a half-Jew, so that he might have better witnessing opportunity, Acts 16.3. That's why I, there's an article in the back I can point you to if you want. You get, okay, if Paul poo-pooed the idea of circumcision, why did he circumcise Timothy? Well, he didn't relate it to faith. So the outer spoke of a greater inner reality. It pointed back to what had already occurred. You can't have the sign without the substance. It would be empty ritual. You've got place after place in the Old Testament where people are offering empty sacrifices because it didn't represent a heart of worship. Many who, because they were ethnic Jews, would be circumcised, but their heart had never been circumcised. That's the greater inner reality. God's intent as declared by Moses, Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. God had constantly warned, cut away the skin, or or the sin, excuse me, the sin that covered the heart. Mixing up the metaphors here, right? Uh, He says in Jeremiah 4, Break up your fallow ground, circumcise yourself, and remove the foreskin of your heart, men of Judah, because of the evil of your deeds, Jeremiah 4, 3 and 4. And later on, Jeremiah is going to talk about what we boast. Remember this boasting theme that Paul started back in chapter 3, and it continued on into chapter 4, that if Abraham was justified because of his works, look at me super Jew that God shined his light upon. Not at all. If God does the working, our boasting is in him. That's what Jeremiah the prophet says. Jeremiah 9, verse 23. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the mighty man boast of his might, or the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. But listen to what he says. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord. I will punish all who are circumcised and yet uncircumcised, Egypt and Judah and Edom and the sons of Ammon and Moab and all those inhabitants inhabiting the desert who clip the hair on their temples for all the nations are uncircumcised and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised of heart. So he's going to get the Gentile nations who are uncircumcised because they are a sinful people. He's going to get his own circumcised people because their hearts aren't circumcised. Do you see the connection? Let's use a an illustration we're much more acquainted with than circumcision. In the church, baptism symbolizes that the believer has died with Christ as they go under the water, raised to newness of life. We are identifying with Christ's death and resurrection. We are already converted before we go into the waters of baptism, and the baptism just illustrates the outward speaks of the internal. 
of God's redemptive act and vital communion with His redeemed, both baptism and communion, vital reminders of the inner reality that compels that obedience in the first place. That's the lesson. What about the application from this that Paul gives us? As we continue on in verse number 11, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised that righteousness might be credited to them. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, the Jewish people, but who also follow in the steps of faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. The uncircumcised Gentiles are saved in the same way. He's the father in faith to all. That's why you've got that so that in verse 11. So that he might be the father. This is his purpose statement. This is a unit defining the purpose served by the two salient facts mentioned in the first part of verse 11. This sign and seal of circumcision. Now, I told you I was going to illustrate this. I I don't remember which all of you in your testimonies as we fellowship together have shared that you grew up in the church and uh, you went to Sunday school and so you learned all the Sunday school songs. Father Abraham had many sons, right? Many sons had Father Abraham, and I won't sing to you anymore because I can't stand my singing. Well, as I started learning in the church about the difference between the church and the Jews, I thought, maybe we can't biblically and accurately still sing the song of Father Abraham because I'm not a Jew. But what Paul does here in verses 11 and 12 is teach what we looked at at the beginning uh, beginning last week. Abraham is the prototype of justification by faith in Christ alone. He's the most important man in the Bible as far as this is concerned. This text shows he is the spiritual father to all who place faith in the Lord. Whether those people are Jews or Gentiles, whether they are circumcised or uncircumcised, it's have they believed? Abraham's your father. He's the prototype. He's the example of God declaring righteous one who is not of themselves, but trusts in him who justifies the ungodly. All such believers, irrespective of circumcision, will enjoy the same justification before God that Abraham enjoyed. If I could quote John Murray again, the systematic theologian of Westminster, he said, he said, Abraham is conceived of as the leader of the band. And we walk not abreast, but in file, following in the footprints left by Abraham. And it's the steps of Abraham's uncircumcision faith, the status of when he was uncircumcised, a faith that receives no conditioning or efficacy from the fact of circumcision. Now, as Paul throws the the concept of circumcision for salvation under the bus here, we need to be careful not to think of circumcision as a liability. It's not a contribution to our salvation, but it's also not an excluding factor. When Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, it's the power of God unto salvation... To everyone who believes, how does he continue? To the Jew first and also to the Greek. The circumcised and the uncircumcised. The obedience of faith, circumcision, came afterwards. Not justified due to his works. Abraham met God. Abraham trusted God. And he was declared righteous by God and then began walking with God. Circumcision then became the mark as a sign and seal of the Jews' set-apartness unto God. These are my peeps. The external was meaningless without the internal, a heart that's been circumcised. So it's not the natural child of Abraham who are God's children. But the children of promise are his offspring. And Paul's going to talk about that as he starts bringing into more Jewishness 
in uh, Romans 9 and verse 8. That is, it's not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise who are regarded as descendants. Father Abraham, by faith. You see, by the time Paul was writing, and he was preceded by Jesus who had to cleanse the temple because Judaism of that day was bankrupt. It was apostate. All of its rituals and requirements was a framework, a skeleton which needed a heart of vibrant faith. If the heart of faith is missing, Jew or anyone else for that matter, they were nothing more than whitewashed tombs which looked beautiful on the outside but instead were dead men's bones, says Jesus in Matthew 23. Or as one preacher put it, a lot of people in our churches here that are starched and ironed but have not been washed within. You know, maybe we can speak a good Christi- Christianese. Let's let Zacchaeus, the wee little man, be our conclusion today. Go back with me to uh, Luke 9. Uh, excuse me, Luke 19. And no, I'm not going to uh, recount the whole story, but it's since now is connected here to Father Abraham. Listen to what Luke tells us through Jewish ears. Luke chapter 19. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Stop for a moment in that first verse. Tax collectors and sinners the off-scouring, the Jews who would even excise extra tax on his own people. What a scum bucket, right? So Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector and rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was. He's unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead, climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he's about to pass through that day. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. For I'm coming to your house today. Yeah, you remember that Sunday school story, aren't you? Verse 6. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. And this was not just a hospitality welcome. Jesus, uh, Zacchaeus met Jesus as Savior that day. Verse 7, when they saw it, they all began to grumble, all the religious hucksters, uh, they're grumbling among themselves, saying, he's gone to be the guest of a man who's a sinner. In other words, that's to say, not like us. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, behold, half of my possessions I'll give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. You see the fruit of uh, regeneration, the fruit of repentance here. Jesus said to him, today salvation's come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. At the beginning of the story, Zacchaeus is lost. He's a sinner. He's a saved, or he's a circumcised Jew, but now he's a completed Jew. He becomes a son of Abraham by faith. So you've got sinners trying to merit God's favor. And sometimes we saints fall back into the same thing, don't we, beloved? Many Christians tied up in performance. And so we need to regularly bring our thoughts into obedience of biblical theology that we are never more loved by God due to our performance than at the moment we met the master when he set his love upon us in the first place. Isn't that good news? You know, we're not manipulated into obedience. So here you've got a lot of people coming to faith in the New Testament, the early church. You've got converts to Christianity who found it hard to break with tradition and nationalistic prejudices. Where you've got the circumcision issue dealt with in Acts 15, we're told that some came down from Judea to Antioch, teaching, brothers, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So Paul gives this masterful response in Romans 4, 9 to 12. 
As far as salvation is concerned, circumcision makes no difference. It amounts to nothing. Just like the administration of the ordinances of baptism and communion, we fill up our baptistry with nasty chlorinated talent water to baptize believers. And the bread and the cup do not become the literal body and blood of Jesus, but they commemorate these acts. They are ordinances for believers. They're not salvific, just like circumcision was not. And it was not to be administered to those without previous justification. You see how foolish it would be to run in to drop some water on a dying child's forehead, fearing that they will otherwise not enter heaven at death? I dealt with this as an early pastor when I was also a chaplain for the hospital in our town where they wanted to know, hey, chaplain, will you offer last rites? And I said, anything I do will not save their souls. That's between them and the Lord, and I cannot administer last rites. So surely it's difficult to overestimate the importance, the significance of Romans 4, 9 to 12. So with just one stroke of the apostle's pen, that huge wall of separation between Jew and Gentile was obliterated and smashed to the ground. Salvation is through faith alone apart from works, verses 1 to 8. More specifically, it's apart from circumcision, verses 9 to 12. And Paul will continue his argument that it's apart from the law, but we'll have to save that for next time. Father of you comes justification because you are the just one and we are unjust and that's why we cried out to Christ to clothe us in his righteousness to credit his perfect life of righteousness and his atoning death to our account by faith thank you that it's none of our doings but all of his and so we boast of the sufficiency and the greatness and the grace of our Savior Jesus. Continue to unpack the glory of your grace in our lives and help us as we go evangelize the lost and show them that it's not in their doings, but if they trust Christ, they too can have their eternity changed. For Christ's sake, we thank you. Amen.